live from the Washington, D.C. area. It's the Inside Scoop, all the news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's the host. Welcome to Inside Scoop. I'm Bettina Lawton, and I'm your host. And today we're going to do a little reintroduction for you of Stacey Kincaid. She is our sheriff. She ran for the first time as a, in a special election in 2013, and she made a whole bunch of promises saying, this is what I'm going to do if I get elected. So we're having her back tonight to talk about how did that work out, and then what are the news things that she's doing? So here's the reintroduction for those of you who don't know her or think she was always our sheriff. She is a 32-year veteran of the Fairfax Sheriff's Office. She first ran for office in 2013 in a special election, which she won to become the first female sheriff in Fairfax County's history. She was re-elected to a full term in 2015. She serves over 1.1 million residents, both in the county of Fairfax, the city of Fairfax, and the towns of Herndon and Vienna. She has won numerous awards over the years. So a sampling is, in 2008, she received the agency's highest honor, the Distinguished Service Award. In 2014, Lawyers Weekly named her an influential woman of Virginia. In 2017, the Junior League of Virginia honored her with its annual Woman of Vision Award. And just last week, she received the Family Hero Award from the Chris Atwood Foundation for the Striving to Achieve Recovery, her STAR program, which we're going to talk about tonight. She is well recognized for the work that she has been doing in the community, both nationally and locally. Um, I want to remind, have her remind us of the core mission of the Sheriff's Office because I recall in 2013 when you ran, nobody knew what the Sheriff's Office did. So what, remind us all, what are those three core missions? So good evening, Bettina, and thank you for having me back on your show. The three core missions of the Sheriff's Office is providing safety and security for the Adult Detention Center. Um, certainly providing security for the 33 sitting judges and the over 1,000 visitors each day that come into the courthouse and serving civil law process on behalf of the courts. Okay. So um, when you ran for office in 2013, you had sort of three major promises that you made. You were going to foster a diverse workforce. Mm -hmm. You were going to engage the community and then sort of a big move the agency forward. So let's talk diverse workforce. When you started, there wasn't a lot of diversity. That's what I remember. So what's happened since 2013? So let me start out by saying that we are the most diverse public safety agency in the area. And actually, just last year, we hired 64% um, of minorities as deputy sheriff hires. And um, again, when it comes to um, diversifying the workforce, one of the biggest changes that we should re be reflecting on is that of promotions. And certainly, I changed the promotion process after I was elected to a process that was more, that was focused on um, what you knew and what you did with that information as opposed to who you knew. So we've gone from um, a diverse population with our promotion from 21% to the following year, which was about 32%, and then of course last year was 39%. So, and you think that's a lot of just changing the promotion practices? Because I do remember you telling me when you, you were running that all of the senior leadership were um, white. Mm -hmm. Most, I think there was one senior person who was female. That's right. So that has, you've changed that around now. So you've got um, different sets of people. Different sets of people, but again, that's reflective of the change in the policy. And again, everybody's afforded an opportunity for a promotion. Okay. Um, let's talk then about the engaging the community because um, the prior sheriffs, and I've been in Fairfax County for a long time, I could fall over them and I would not know who they are. And that cannot be said about you. Everybody knows you, you get stopped regularly in places. So what are you doing differently to engage the community? So community engagement is probably one of the biggest changes that we've made and after I was elected, obviously people know what the police department does, they know what the fire department does, but no one knew what the sheriff's department did. And it was important that we open up the agency because it shouldn't be a secret of, of how we do business. 
And by, when I say opening up the agency, we've offered tours. We brought in different groups of folks that deal with uh, mental illness. We brought in consumers. We've just opened it up. But the other thing is, is that we go out into the community, and that's intentional. And my staff and I make it a point to go out in the community, whether it's to some type of festival, whether it's to a church, a mosque, whether it's to um, a library or to elementary schools, which we've been doing a lot of reading across America. But we make it a point to go out and to let people know what we do and what we're about. And oftentimes we find that folks that are immigrants coming to this country, they have no idea. Uh, many times they're afraid of government. Mm -hmm. So what we do is, again, we engage, we go out. And because we're such a diverse agency, we're reflective of the population, not only that we serve inside of the adult detention center, but also that within the community. So when someone sees you know, a, a deputy or even a civilian staff member that looks like them, it makes it just much more, um, it makes it, I don't know if it's easier, but the transition and also letting people know what we're about and when you see one of us, it shouldn't be because something bad has happened. So is that why, because I saw something um, on Facebook, I think a week or so ago, and you were reading to these tiny little kids and then you swore them all in as like deputy, junior deputies or something. Is that why you go out to these to the schools and deal with these little kids so they have a positive interaction with law enforcement? That's right, and that's what we do. We go out because we want to you know, be that positive influence, that role model, and going out and working with children and being just sitting down and, and talking with them and then having the deputy, the junior deputy, you know, taking the oath of office, if you will. Mm -hmm. The kids get very excited about that. They're very proud of it. We focus on, you know, being kind, not bullying, you know, taking care of each other, helping your family, helping your teacher, doing well in school. And those are all very positive influences that we're able to bring to the schools and to the children. So there are a couple of programs that I have heard about, one of which I think is enormously important, and that is your Safety Seat Saturday, which is right. child safety seats, right? That's correct. And so people bring them with them in the car? What is that? What is, tell us what that is. So Child Safety Seat Saturday, we have that each month, the last Saturday of the month. We do events during, during throughout the course of the year, but with Child Safety Seat Saturday, um, we advertise it. We have parents, we've got caregivers, we've got grandparents that come physically up to um, the, um, the campus, if you will, our campus, and we install or help install safety seats. And what we have found, we, we install thousands of seats a year, but typically we find that 80% of the seats that have been installed were not installed correctly. Wow. So we change that and we fix that. And again, it's another positive experience that we get to have with the community and also with young children. That's pretty amazing. I remember putting this child safety seats in the back of my car when my kids were little. And even back then, it was like, I got no clue. There were all these straps, there were all these things. So I'm not really surprised that 80% of them were installed wrong. So people need to go out, come on over on that Saturday and, and fix it because that's really a dangerous situation it for is. their little kids. So I wanted to ask you about something. I saw a reference to it, but I don't really know what it is. I think it was called the Sheriff and Me Tea. What is that? Okay, so that was a program that um, actually one of my uh, lieutenants came up with, Summer Grasty, and the Sheriff and Me Tea Party is just that. And what we do is we work with children um, that are residing in emergency shelters, young girls, and we have a tea party. But we also, along with that tea party, we do so many other things, uh, you know, of, of engaging with, with these young women. and they are able to make their own hats, they're able to actually come to the cafeteria within the courthouse. Um, we set it up and it's really a big deal. And then of course we do the catwalk, we've got music playing, oh my gosh. and it's just a very, very fun day. We also actually um, kind of crossed over and we had a gentleman's um, afternoon and that was again with children, young, young boys mm -hmm. residing in the emergency shelters and where we had staff that actually um, came on men and they everything from how to tie a tie oh, wow. to just making cool. it a real fun day and having that engagement and having that one-on-one -on -one. and again these kids you know they often don't have positive ex experiences with um, the police so this is just an opportunity for them to see that we too are real people. Wow. 
Um, that sounds really interesting. I know that you've done a lot of work on things like domestic violence, mm -hmm. um, both in terms of folks who are in the jail because of that in some fashion, but then also out in the community as well in terms of outreaching to people and, and that kind of a thing. So tell us, what are, you, what are you doing about that? So we recognize that in the jail we have inmates that are victims, bystanders, and perpetrators. So through our partnership um, with Fairfax Falls Church Community Services Board, we are very fortunate that we have um, um, behavioral health specialists that come in and actually talk and provide information prevention on what domestic violence actually is and what to expect mm -hmm. and how to deal with it and how to prevent it and how to report it. Um, we also do a lot of work in the community, um, especially with most recently um, the Vienna Women's Club and Just Ask, which is about human trafficking. And it's about getting the word out, talking about it, and also educating folks as to what to look for, how to prevent it, how to report it. And the biggest thing is an awareness campaign, but also talking with many, many other groups throughout the county that um, let, to let them know that um, domestic violence is not okay. So I want to go back a second. You used the phrase human trafficking, which I think a lot of people associate with border issues, but that's not what you're talking about. What, when you say that you do a lot of work in, in human trafficking, what, ex, what is that? What does that mean in Northern Virginia? What that means is that there is a problem with human trafficking, the, the buying and the selling of, of young girls, young boys, and it's, it's definitely a big problem. Um, just ask prevention. Again, the CEO is Bill Wolf, who mm -hmm. has been very instrumental in bringing attention and awareness, helping to get bills passed. I mean, again, it's one of those topics that people don't believe is a problem or an issue in Fairfax County when, in fact, it is. Wow. OK. A um, couple other things that I just want to see if you can explain to us real briefly is like so I know you do a child ID thing so what's the point of that what is little kids get little ID cards so our child ID program is one of our most popular programs and we go all around the county as well as the city and towns where we have deputy sheriffs as well as our civilian staff that actually make child identification cards these identification cards are essentially for the families um, grandparents, whoever may be the caregivers, and the card has information, um, the child's name, the a picture, demographics, but this is not information that we, we keep or store, mm -hmm. but again, it's a great thing for a parent or caregiver to have. Okay. All right. Well, good. We've learned a little bit more about what you're doing and reaching out to the community. Um, so we're going to take a break here. And when we come back, we're going to spend some more time with the sheriff about some of the major projects that she has brought into the uh, adult detention center. Okay, so we drowned the fire, yep. stirred it, mm -hmm. drowned it again, mm -hmm. and now just feel if it's cold. Yeah. Cool. Smokey just gave me a bear hug. I know. I already posted it. responsibility. Oh, it's huge. I know, it's huge. And the salary. Oh my goodness, yes. 
I right. mean, like, I was literally, I was about to move in with my parents, and <laughs> right before, yeah, so this saved me. I, I really believe in you, you know? Thank you. It's nice to hear that from someone. <laughs> These are cool. Did you, um, what did you? We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back. I'm Bettina Lawton, and I'm your host. And we are talking to Sheriff Stacy Kincaid. Uh, she is the sheriff of Fairfax County, city, the towns of Herndon and Vienna. And we're talking about some of the changes that she put into place when she became the sheriff back in 2013. Um, I will mention, of course, that the election this year is next week and the sheriff is on the ballot again. So let's talk about some of the major changes that you did when you first became sheriff. There was quite the flurry of activity when you first got elected in, in 13. Right. So one of the first major changes that I made was I changed the release time um, for inmates that were going to be getting out of jail. So what, when did they used to get released? They used to get released at midnight or one minute after midnight. And okay. asking around and trying to, I mean, this was just the part of what, this is how we've always done business and we're going to continue to do that. Well, releasing someone in the middle of the night when they have no place to go, no transportation, there's nothing good that comes of right. that. So I changed it to 8 o'clock in the morning. And that was a much more reasonable time when there were resources available, and especially for, for people that had nowhere to go. Right. Yeah, releasing anybody out in midnight is sort of like nothing good happens then. This is not a good idea. That's right. There was also discussion about, well, you know, we want to save money so we don't have to serve them breakfast. Oh, and sense. breakfast cost me $1.41 per meal. So at that point, I'm just thinking, you know what, regardless, yeah. We're going to release them at a time. We're going to feed them breakfast, and we are going to, you know, point them in the right direction. Wow, it's so. the basic. It's the simple things like that that people, as you say, we've always done it that way, and they're gone. It's not our problem anymore. They're out in the streets. That's right. That's right. That is not good. Now I do remember after you first got elected, and I had never actually been in the jail. Thank you. <laughs> um, but you walked me through the jail, and there was a facility there for um, men who had mental health issues. And then we went to one that looked just like it, but it was full of stuff. It was like a storage unit. Mm -hmm. um, and there wasn't anything for the females. So is this the females have no mental health problems? I mean, that was kind of like, sho it was sh totally shocking to me to see. That's right. So I made that change as well. So we had behavioral health housing for men, and we needed to make sure we had it for women. The behavioral health, how, the behavioral health housing units were co-located next to our um, jail-based community services staff, which just made sense. Mm -hmm. The other thing was these housing locations had more light. The cells were larger, um, natural light, as opposed to the other previous locations where the light stayed on 24-7. Oh, wow. And it was just, it was a very small cell. And we're out of the business of housing individuals in a solitary or that type of confining area. Mm -hmm. So now we have a female behavioral health housing unit. So of the people who are in the jail, how many people have behavioral health, which I guess is the current phrase for mental health or substance abuse um, disorders. What's the percentage of people in the jail who have that problem? So we estimate that number to be about 40%. Wow. And that often can include a co-occurring substance use disorder. Okay. The, um, I guess the, st the statistics are one in every five Americans do have some form of mental health um, concern. Well, one of the um, questions that I've always sort of had with that is, I, I read something about training, training your deputies in some mm -hmm. kind of mental health, first responder, first aid, something. What right. was that about? So what that is about, that is called crisis intervention team training. Okay. And the state mandates that 25% of your staff must be certified in, in crisis intervention team training. 
um, there are some agencies that take it a step further and want to exceed that 25%, but the state recognizes that not everybody wants to be um, certified in that. Nevertheless, we have made it mandatory that we have mental health first aid training for all of our staff. Okay. So at the end of the day, we've got staff available 24-7, 365 days a year that's available to deal with folks that are in crisis and to be able to de-escalate a situation. And that's very, very important. Okay. So let's talk about some other things because we can go on about mental health and substance abuse for a while. Um, but you've done some other things, which I saw on your website. So I went over to your website to see what was there. And there was this woman teaching yoga. And I thought, really? Why? What, right. what is that about? So what yoga is about is it's about mindfulness. And what we have found that by having yoga taught in the adult detention center, and it started out with just women, but of course we're equal opportunity. So again, we have yoga for men now. But what it does, it, as I mentioned, mindfulness and getting folks in better, in a better, I guess, if you will, better frame of mind, calming, teaching them to deal with certain um, types of things that may trigger their behavior. And another thing that with this yoga program that's been very, very successful is we've recognized that there's been an 80% decline in in-house jail violations. Oh, wow. So it's really, really working. But again, it's, it's, a, it's something that's in place to help people cope. Well, I was just so surprised when I saw it. I was sort of like, okay, whatever. So, but you've also done, because I've seen different things like on Facebook, you had some kind of a graduation for, I guess, inmates? So um, we have expanded our education classes, our GED classes, high school diploma, um, skill source classes, classes that are focused on, if you, if you, I guess you could say re rehabilitation, because as Fairfax County is considered one of the safest jurisdictions of its size, we play a part with our public safety team. So we're ensuring that while and when somebody does come to jail, that they're given the skills maybe that they had never learned before or other opportunities to um, get, for example, um, a certification in food service or safe serve certification, as well as we've got um, OAR, Opportunities, Alternatives, and uh, Restoration as well as other partners that are able to assist us with providing services for those to help better themselves so when they do get out of jail, they have a better chance to succeed. And again, we realize that people may come back to jail, but our goal is to, again, we give second chances, third chances for folks to succeed, but to get people back out in the community in a better state of mind, in a better state of health, mentally and physically, that's the goal because we recognize that a healthier community is a safer community. Okay. So you also, I think that you're the person who did this. You started job fairs for inmates? That's right. So who participates? What's the, I mean, these are these only for people who are like getting out or what? what? Because so, what is that? Right, so these are our inmate resource fairs and we have them twice a year. And what we do with that is we bring vendors in. Vendors that are affiliated with um, um, Alcoholics Anonymous or Together We Bake or the League of Women Voters or DMV Select, which is a contract that we do with the DMV, which they come to our facility and provide IDs in a secure location. Because oftentimes we recognize that inmates that are leaving the jail, they don't have a, an identification card. So if you could just imagine not having an ID, what does that mean? It means that mm -hmm. you're probably not going to get a job. If you have a check, you're probably not going to be able to cash that check. So we are focused on bringing in um, a variety of resources that are going to help our inmate population as they transition back into the community. So do they have to be within, in order to participate in these kinds of fairs, do they have to be within a certain number of days or months or whatever of getting out? Or is this something if you're sort of thinking long term for yourself that says, well, I've got a year to go or two years to go. Let me go figure this thing out. We, um, it used to be like if you were, have 12 months, mm -hmm. but again, any inmate that's eligible to attend these resource fairs, we open it up to because it's important that they know what's available and, you know, out there for them because oftentimes you're in jail, you think, what am I going to do when I get out of jail? Yeah. Certainly housing is one of the big 
ticket items because sustainable housing is very difficult and when you when one leaves jail and if they are a felon um, that's another thing where where am I going to go live where am I going to go get a job where am I going to go work so we bring different resources to our jail so people know what is available okay um, let me ask a couple of other ones um, as I recall, you've got certain community groups that like deal with mental illness will come in and do mm -hmm. meetings or something. What is what was that? So uh, you're probably talking about NAMI and okay. um, the National Association for the Mentally Ill. And when we started making changes with the way that we do business and more importantly, the way that we um, work with those that are in crisis, we recognized that the families, it's very tragic for them as well. So NAMI, obviously they're av the advocates, they're consumers. We opened up the jail for them to come in and we meet with them along with our confinement staff, our behavioral health staff, our medical staff, um, psychologists. So they have a better understanding of how we do business, but more importantly, they know that their, their adult child, if you will, is gonna be okay when they are incarcerated. And we also offer that if somebody does get arrested and it's two, three, four o'clock in the morning, you know, one of the biggest fears that a parent may have is, oh my gosh, where's my, where's my, my son, where's my daughter? So we have a, a phone line available so they can call in and we will go and check, physically check on that individual and certainly put them on the phone to connect them if they haven't been able to get through. And it's just another way of, you know, it's about human capital. Mm -hmm. So it's another way of us reaching out and saying, look, this is how we can help you. This is what we're here to do. Because the goal when somebody does come into jail that has a mental illness is to get them stabilized. Okay. That's the number one goal. And again, way back in the day, if you couldn't get somebody stabilized, then okay, that's just how it was. But jails, I truly believe, or in prisons, were never designed to be psychiatric hospitals. So that's, that's something that we are moving away from, and we recognize that people are better served um, either in a psychiatric facility or, again, being released back to their, their families, um, taking their medication. So there's all different ways that we have come up with, some creative, um, mm -hmm. that have never been done before, and that's what I believe makes us very... Um, um, we're, we're an agency, we're a county that people are actually paying attention to because all of this work is not done just by the sheriff's office. We're very fortunate with our partners, with our stakeholders, with our community leaders, with our nonprofits, and with our consumers, and that's why we do or are able to do great things. Okay. Well, good. I, we're going to take a break again. We're going to come back. We're going to bring Lynn Tomlinson over. She is the Deputy Director of Clinical Operations at the CSB, one of your partners to talk about two major initiatives that have been going on um, for the last couple of years uh, involving behavioral health. So stay with us. Nice going, Spencer. I can't believe we broke old man Hennessy's window. Correction, dude, you broke. I just threw the ball. This is really bad. What are we gonna do? We? we? Go to the door and ask for the ball back. Are you serious? It's my ball, Myrtlebeck. You're so dead. I had to run away. Yeah, to Uruguay. Kiss your life goodbye. Sorry. Let's go. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. You're me and you're well. Some friend you are. Oh. Keep smiling. Keep shining. Hi. Hi. Tell him it was an accident. We can fix the window. Come on. I'll come with you. Loyalty. Pass it on. You go first. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. One day these rats were playing in the woods. One of some matches and that's no good. Listen to smoke before you give it a try. Only you. Don't play with matches. Don't play with fire. Only you can prevent wildfires. Fire.
awkward. I'm the awkward silence. You try to avoid me, then there I am again. But an awkward silence can be a great thing. Like Kelly here is about to demonstrate. You haven't really been yourself lately. Are you okay? Find out how you can help a friend with their mental health at SeizeTheAwkward.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back. I'm Bettina Lawton, and I'm your host, and this is Inside Scoop. And as you can tell, we have added a new person. This is Lynn Tomlinson. She is the Deputy Director for Clinical Operations for the Fairfax Falls Church Community Services Board. We'll find out a little bit about what that is because people seem to be confused. Um, she uh, oversees all the clinical resources for people with mental health, substance abuse, and developmental disabilities. She is a, has a graduate degree with a focus on community agency counseling, which I had never heard of before, I must confess. Um, she has served on the board of Virginia Association of Alcoholism and Drug Abuse Counselors as the president of the Northern Region. She serves on the Fairfax County and Regional Task Force for Prescription Drug and Heroin Abuse, and she chaired the Fairfax County Youth Suicide Review Team. She began her career with the CSB in 1994 as a behavioral health specialist, providing direct services to youth with co-occurring disorders. She's also worked for the CSB in the Juvenile Forensics Unit, was a clinical supervisor at Crossroads and Cornerstones, the manager of the Crossroads Youth Program. And prior to being deputy director, uh, Lynn was the assistant Deputy Director for Acute Treatment Services, and I'm glad to have you back. You. We had you here about a year or yes. so ago. Um, so I want to sort of set the stage. I want to talk mm -hmm. about the Community Services Board. So first, just what is it? Excellent. Well, I wanted to say thank you so much for having me on the show again. I really appreciate it. Always glad to be here with you, Sheriff Kincaid, so thank you. Uh, the Community Services Board is the behavioral health provider for individuals who reside in Fairfax County and the cities of Fairfax Falls Church. Uh, we serve um, adults and youth with behavioral health issues to include mental health conditions, substance use disorder, as well as developmental delay. Uh, we really consider ourselves the behavioral health safety net because individuals may be able to receive services elsewhere. However, um, there's many people who due to the severity of their illness or for other reasons can only seek services through us. Okay, so about how many people, how big is it? How many people get served and, and those kind of things? How many employees? Uh, great question, sure. We have between full-time full and part-time uh, staff about 1,400 employees and we serve um, about 22,000 people per year. Okay, so this is a big operation for the This whole. is a very significant operation and we have services um, and I know we'll be discussing this later, but our emergency services at our Maryfield site, we offer um, same-day um, access services, we offer outpatient services, we offer residential services, we offer partial hospitalization services, um, in, uh, intensive um, outpatient, outpatient treatment services, medication services, and support coordination services, as well as residential services for individuals with ID and DD and employment services. <laughs> So I think it probably would have been easier to just ask you what you don't do. <laughs> That's quite a list. That's an amazing list. So let's talk about the Maryfield Crisis mm -hmm. Response Center, MCRC. Yes. So that opened up on January 1, 2016. Mm -hmm. So what, what is that? That's in Maryfield, obviously. Mm -hmm. It's off of um, Route 50. Mm -hmm. So what, what is that? What makes it a crisis response center? What are the services offered there? That's a great question. So Maryfield is our largest um, outpatient um, provider of uh, CSB services. And what difference, differentiates the MCRC from the other parts of the building is, one, it's 24-7. So um, right now we could walk in there and, and get services, um, or we could call at any time. Uh, the number there uh, is 703-573-5679. I always say that because someone might need that number uh, sometimes. Um, part of what, though, makes the MCRC different is that um, while law enforcement could always bring someone to the MCRC, starting on January uh, 1st of 2016, we were able to do what's called an exchange of custody. And this involves um, Sheriff Kincaid's team, uh, Chief Rossler's team, 
where a police officer can literally bring someone who's in some type of crisis to the MCRC um, and exchange custody with someone who is based there and then that uh, law enforcement person can be back on the street and the individual can receive the care they need for uh, mental health, substance use, developmental delays um, uh, right there in MCRC, often in lieu of um, some type of involvement with the justice system. So that is, is, so is that what is called diversion first? Is that the beginning of the diversion first process that you just described? So the beginning of the diversion first um, process is, as Sheriff Kincaid was speaking about, the CIT trained officers. Um, the officers on the street um, have the discretion whether or not to bring someone in. But yes, once someone comes into MCRC, that is another diversionary point. Okay, because Sheriff, my recollection is that um, you were instrumental in getting this going. I, you went and visited Texas someplace, Austin, Dallas, or someplace. Texas is a big state. So why did you get involved in a diversion first thing? That's kind of like you're law enforcement. Don't, don't you want more people coming on in? It's sort of like. So let me go back to, you know, the jail not being a psychiatric hospital and a better place for someone may not be. Um, certainly mm -hmm. in the adult detention center. So what I did was I took a small group down to Bear County in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah, close, that's close. Close, um, some of my staff and um, the former um, executive director of the CSB, mm -hmm. Tisha Deegan and Gary Ambrose, who of course you will know, mm -hmm. as well as um, a couple people from the police department and Julie Carey from Channel 4 News who did a segment on our mm -hmm. trip and what it is as far as best practices that we brought back to start our own program. The purpose was going down there was that I knew the sheriff at the time, um, Sheriff Susan Pomerlo, and what they had been doing with behavioral health, with substance use, with homelessness, they had a model um, which, again, was something that we wanted to emulate. Mm -hmm. So we brought back certain things that would work in Fairfax County, we presented it to the Board of Supervisors and we're very fortunate that Chairman Sharon Bulova and Supervisor John Cook out of the Braddock District were um, very much um, for this program and what it is we were gonna do. So this is the part where we reached out to as many folks as possible. We called them stakeholders because we recognize that we can't do it on our own and the way that the model is in Bear County they have several stakeholders ranging from um, actually the University of Texas Hospital in San Antonio to consumers to um, public defender's offices to the Commonwealth, Defend Commonwealth uh, Attorney's Office to the police to um, probation. So bringing all these people together and talking about, you know, hey, we can do something here. And then, of course, this was just kind of something that just rolled. Mm -hmm. Um, people bought into it. They thought that it was, you know, not only a good idea, but the right thing to do because we were about saving lives. And as I mentioned, we're an extension of the public health system. So it became just by, again, default that we would get folks that nobody else wanted to actually deal with. I mean, that was the sad part about it. So, you know, we've been great partners mm -hmm. and we've made so many strides with the Diversion First program. Well, I'm pretty, listening to you say we had these people and the Commonwealth attorneys and the public defenders and the CSB and the, it's, from my perspective, it's kind of like it's a miracle anything got done. There were so many people involved. That was quite, quite something. So how many people do you think have been diverted so far? So I do know the answer to that and do not have it on the tip of my tongue. Okay. Sheriff, how about you? So I do know that we are over 1,500 individuals Excellent. that have been okay. diverted from incarceration into um, a, a program, either whether it is um, a supervised release program or whether it they've been diverted to some treatment facility. So has this caused the number of people in your jail to go down? Is that is that the end effect of this diversion? So. When I was first elected, the population in our jail was about 1,233 inmates. It's gone down 33% because currently I, our population is about 804 inmates. And I attribute that to the work that's being done with our diversion programs and that it's just a very different way of doing business and getting people the help they need 
and also, you know, as, as you all know, um, getting rid of that stigma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, it goes back to the awareness piece and how we're able to let folks know what we're doing. And of course, people that get, they get it often have family members or, you know, have, know somebody that is, has some form of mental illness. But the other thing is that I want to say is that we have to stop relying on tragedies in order to do something because you hear about a tragedy and all of a sudden we have these focus groups and steering groups and we need to figure out what we're gonna do, enough with it. Because we're not gonna arrest our way out of you know, dealing with folks that have greater needs. And they're the way underrepresented populations that often don't get the services that they need. So can anybody qualify for this diversion first thing? So, or is it only a certain type of criminal involvement, so I'm assuming like I go out and I, as we say, shoot someone on Fifth Avenue. I can't qualify for diversion. That would be too big of a situation. So it's low risk offenses, mm -hmm. kind of like nuisance, nuisance crimes. Okay. Um, you know, we've had people that were diverted because, or for trying to get help at a hospital, okay? So very low risk nonviolent crimes is currently the criteria for diversion. Okay, so if somebody shows up at, so the police bring somebody into mm -hmm. diversion first, they hand off mm -hmm. to the enforcement people who are there, the law enforcement people who are there, then what happens to them? Is that where the CSB people become involved, or, mm -hmm. or what happens next? Yes, yeah, so the CSB uh, staff who are there, um, and there's a range of staff who work there. We have um, physicians, we have um, physicians who are psychiatrists, we have peer support specialists who are individuals who have lived experience, and we have uh, staff who are certified pre-screeners. Um, in Virginia, the only way someone can be in a hospital against their will is if they go before a certified pre-screener. Um, and so we do have those staff. Um, we really like to focus on the peer support specialists because if you think about it, no one is walking into the MCRC on their best day. <laughs> so be um, no one absolutely is doing that. And to, to have someone who can say, you know, I've been where you've been, let me share my experience with you, um, is really helpful. Oftentimes though, um, there are people who may not want to talk about it at the time and just to have someone to be there sitting with them is wonderful. So as a peer specialist, and I've heard the phrase, um, and you said they had lived experience. Mm -hmm. So are, is there training? Are they all yes. trained in something? Yes. Or they have a certain amount of recovery? How does that work? That's What's a wonderful that? question. Thank you very much. Um, people do have lived experience and are in recovery from a uh, mental health condition and or substance use disorder. And yes, there is a very rigorous training that people have to pass in order to be a certified peer support specialist. Okay. Well, we are going to take another break. And then when we come back, we're going to continue to talk a little bit about diversion first. And then the sheriff started up a program with the CSB called um, STAR, I believe. And when we come back, we'll find out a little bit about what that's about as well. Stay tuned. time is gonna come Your time is gonna come It's up to you to reach out to Be that friend who comes along Your day is gonna come When you make a friend, you make a difference Your day is gonna come Friendship. Pass it on. A message from the Foundation for a Better Life. Good one, son. Last summer, my new dad took me on vacation. <laughs> First, we went deep sea fishing. Wow! I'm so proud of you, son. <laughs> and then we went on Thunder Shark. That was awesome! Let's go again! Three times. <laughs> I gotta say, it was pretty cool. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. What's it feel like when a woman's having a heart attack? Chest pain, like there's a ton of weight on your chest. Severe shortness of breath. Unexplained nausea. Cold sweats. There's an unusual tiredness and fatigue. There's unfamiliar dizziness or lightheadedness. Unusual pain in your back, neck, jaw, one or both arms, even your upper stomach are signs you're having a heart attack. Don't make excuses. Make the call to 911 immediately. Learn more at womenshealth.gov slash heart attack. 
Operation Wonder Park is a go! There's nothing more powerful than imagination. Honey, have you seen my cell phone? But don't just imagine. My park came to life? Ooh, a plot twist! Use STEM to build. Ta-da! Create. She did it! And change the world. Who's with me? I'm more of a two feet on the ground kind of guy. No, 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 no. Tomorrow. If she can stem, so can you. Find out more at She Can Stem. We're back to the Inside Scoop. Here again, your host. Welcome back. I'm Bettina Lawton, and I'm your host. And with me tonight is Sheriff Stacy Kincaid, who obviously is the sheriff, and Lynn Tomlinson, who is the de Deputy Director for Clinical Services for the Community Services Board. So, I just wanted to finish off the um, peer, su peer support. Is, is that what that's called, peer? peer? Yes. So, mm -hmm. so, these are folks, there's actual training for mm -hmm. this. So, does everybody involved in this, are they all trained? Because when you first said it, I thought it sounded like what you hear about AA meetings of lived experiences and people mm -hmm. sharing. But it's more formal than that. It is more formal, and there's certainly... Um, People have guidance on boundaries and ethics and how to engage with an individual, so it really is a clear and rigorous training. Um, I would like to, if I could, just go back, though, to something I was saying earlier when I spoke about the pre-screeners. I really want to be clear that not everyone who is diverted and not everyone who comes into the R MCRC ends up in the hospital. Okay. I would not want to ever say anything that would dissuade anyone from coming into the MCRC. So really what we try to do is have individuals offered a service at really um, the least restrictive alternative is what we call it. So it may be that um, I go into the MCRC and I'm and someone speaks with me, I talk about my crisis, I have a plan, and I go home. So that is certainly an option. It does not mean at all that I could, that everyone ends up in the hospital. Okay, good. Well, I'm seeing on our teleprompter here that Jeannie from Fairfax has a question, but I'm not seeing the question. So um, I guess we'll just move on, and if the question gets put into the teleprompter, I will ask it. So. Um, let me ask you about this though. So we have people come in, they get assessed and all of that good stuff. But what if I'm not eligible for any kind of diversion? It's, it's too much. I mean, now I'm, I'm, I don't get any, I, I'm done. I don't get any more, there's no other opportunities for it. So no, we certainly have other opportunities. There could be a um, service within the CSB someone would be eligible for, a service within the community someone would be eligible for. At Maryfield, we also have a peer resource center, and anyone in the community can attend that. So our peers um, offer services and offer that information to an individual who comes in. So Sheriff, if I, I don't get diverted at all, I, I'm just, whatever the crime was, it's not low level, I'm high risk, whatever the deal is, and I end up in your jail. Mm -hmm. So what kind of behavioral service, services can I get there? I mean, what, what happens there? So anybody that comes into jail that's, that's booked in, we um, evaluate, we assess a variety of questions re re regarding their mental health as well as substance use, and they're seen and evaluated by our, our medical staff as well as our behavioral health staff. There is an opportunity post-arrest to get diverted, and to, to do that, we work with our court services staff as well as Public Defender's Office, the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, as well as the Judiciary. So one can get diverted afterwards and they're put on a what we call a supervised release program. So that's pre-sentencing. So that's another opportunity as well. Okay, so it's not just a one and done. Mm -hmm. um, there are other ways of, of getting sort of diverted and moved off and, and that good stuff. Right, but okay. one of, the, one of the, the key components is stabilization. Mm -hmm. And when someone comes into the adult detention center and they are not stabilized, that is the goal, and that's what we focus on, getting that person stabilized. Okay. And that's where we can partner with um, the sheriff's office. Um, I've had the privilege to be in the jail, um, you know, visiting with the team, and just to be able to see the work that the deputies, the sheriff's deputies are doing in collaboration with the CSB staff is really amazing because the sheriff is absolutely right. Stability is, is key as an individual is going back out into the community. So in addition to peer specialist type folks, the CSB actually has other staff Correct. over mm -hmm. at the jail mm -hmm. to work with um, the mentally or the substance abuse 
mm -hmm. folks. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and to provide information on crisis intervention, uh, medication as needed. Okay, so I did want to say, or go to this STAR program, this Striving to Achieve Recovery program, which I guess you just got the award last week from the Chris mm -hmm. Atwood Foundation about that. So what is that? What's that program? What's that all about? So our STAR program um, is a um, highly um, structured, intensive alcohol treatment and recovery program. And the program was put in place because we recognize that when someone does get out of jail, we're releasing folks that are sober because their drugs and alcohol are not available in jail. But we need to go further than that. And we wanted to start the recovery process because again, that becomes a lifestyle change while folks were still locked up. So there are two phases of this program. The first phase is about uh, 90 days, the second phase the same. And it is um, a program that is actually, I say holistic, authentic, because it's run by peers. So we have yeah. peer specialists, certified peer specialists that between two of them, the two gentlemen that, that work um, in, the, in the housing unit, that have um, a, a number of years of recovery between the both of them. And we believe that it makes sense, and just as you previously heard from Lynn, that having somebody that has been there, done that, that has that credibility, if you will, to be able to go in there and to talk and to recognize triggers and to you know, work their program, so to speak. But one of the main parts, components of that program is trauma-informed care. What is trauma-informed care? So I don't know what that trauma -informed is. Trauma-informed care, which I don't have the, the professional term, but when I talk about trauma-informed care, I talk about the topic that, you know, many people have experienced some form of trauma during the course of their lives, whether as a child when maybe they saw their parents um, in a domestic violence situation, or maybe they saw their um, brother or their, their, their parent, whatever, shooting, shooting dope or, you know, just drinking excessively. These type of situations in these environments, they, they have a significant impact on kids, on, on people. And again, it's a coping mechanism that I guess becomes part or is part of the disease where they're in the business of trying to continue to get higher, to continue to self-medicate. But I'll turn over the trauma-informed care to Lynn <laughs> because she's got the, the professional, obviously, clinical sure. definition. Absolutely. Well, well, the sheriff really um, talked about the sort of precipitance of trauma. Um, and also, um, I really appreciate the fact that you talked about witnessing trauma is, is very significant. And so trauma-informed care really talks about um, the fact that I would really approach an individual as though they had a trauma, whether they did or not. Because so many times we don't know what can trigger the trauma. So even though I'm not, for example, yelling at someone or whatever, maybe I'm wearing a perfume that their mother wore. Oh. Their mother who had been abusive to them wore. Um, maybe I have mannerisms like their father. And so we just really want to be trauma informed. And that doesn't mean that I can't have my own personality or I can't wear perfume. I just need to be aware that that may, may, may be a trigger. And so what we try to do is when possible to offer people um, choices because that assists with trauma informed care provide information about what we're doing. So I wouldn't just say, you know, all right, you know, come on, Bettina, we're going to a group. I would say, you know, gosh, let me tell you about this group we're having, give you information, would you like to come? And then, you know, try to engage the person. So just really, it's kind of doing some things differently than we used to do them. That's more respectful. You're sort of treating me mm -hmm. like a person who could make a good decision mm -hmm. by saying, here's what we're gonna do. Absolutely, and you know, also just being very mindful of some of those experiences um, that, that the sheriff was describing, um, it's hard for people to separate from them. So even though that may have been 30 years ago, I may be reliving it right now. Right. Now, I wanted to go back on something because you mentioned a housing unit. So this, is, this isn't something where the people participating in this program just sort of come together during the day in some location. Is there, They're actually housed together? There's a, there's a special place? They are all housed together in a direct supervision um, housing unit mm -hmm. and um, the the program is run by the peer support mm -hmm. specialists. There is a deputy sheriff in the housing unit that that's the responsibility to ensure that the program is running but also the safety and security. Um, and the program is voluntary. 
Okay. So um, we, we, real, we recognize that when somebody's forced to do something that they don't want to do just to have to check the box, mm -hmm. oftentimes that doesn't work. So do, do I get, um, you always read it in, in the trashy novels that I read, <laughs> uh, time off for good behavior? I mean, do they get, do they get something like that? Why would, why would somebody volunteer? Why would they volunteer? Because yeah. they want to help themselves and they recognize that what they've been doing and the actions that they have, the behavior that they have demonstrated outside of jail isn't really working for them, especially when they're ending up back in jail. So what this program does, it's an educational program. We provide, um, we treat people with dignity, we provide hope, and it, at the end of the day, it's the goal of not having them come back into jail. So with these two 90-day segments, is this your six months from your release date? Is that how you qualify for this? Or can you do it at any time? How does one get into this program then? So the first, there's criteria that's put in place. You have to be a Fairfax County, Fairfax City, or Town of Hernan, Town of Vienna resident. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is that, as I mentioned, um, the people that are, that are going to be in this program, they go before an interview panel. Mm -hmm. And the interview panel is staff from the jail-based behavioral health, um, as well as our staff, and then the peer support specialists are on this interview panel. Okay. The other part of that criteria is that somebody has to be a chronic user of drugs and or alcohol. We don't separate it that, you know, you just have to be addicted to opiates. We say addiction is addiction is addiction. Okay. So that's how this program starts. And as far as having so much time left, I mean, ideally we'd like for people to be in the program certainly more than six months, mm -hmm. I mean, more than six months, up to a year, whatever it is they need. And again, once they graduate from the program, mm -hmm. we're focused on getting them certified as peer specialists as well. Mm -hmm. So do they, when they graduate from this program, do they have to go back into the general population at the jail or do they stay with this group but, but are now training to be the peer specialists? They stay with the group. Okay, okay. So that way they're a part, they're another resource we can use. And in fact, we did something very creative when we went down to Chesterfield, mm -hmm. because that's where we, again, we go places, we bring back best practices. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, but mm -hmm. when we do that, we end up with a really good product. Um, but we borrowed, I borrowed inmates mm -hmm. from Chesterfield, two inmates that were the peer specialists or peer certified specialists that were running the program. So I borrowed two inmates Brought, had them brought up to Fairfax, and we started our program like wow. that. Mm -hmm. Wow, I didn't know you could do that, borrowing people's, other people's inmates. That's amazing. We just a jail transfer. I mean, they certainly oh, got credit cool. for being oh, okay. in, the, in the jail. <laughs> well, I want to thank both of you thank for you. coming on tonight. I think we've learned a lot. Hopefully, everybody out there has learned about the great services, both available in the community with the Community Services Board, but I sort of realized that a, the sheriff actually did what she said she was going to do, but is continuing to try and improve the lives and reduce recidivism in Fairfax County. Thanks.